That's beautiful. Amen. I'm glad I'm here today. Would you turn to the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation? You notice I've been doing a lot of preaching out of this book lately. I had something else planned all week, and the Lord said, No, son, you're going to Revelation. Yes, Lord. <laughs> yes, Lord. Revelation 1, if you'd like to stand with me this morning as we open the infallible book. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The scripture says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. You can be seated. In chapter 1, verse 8, he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, <clears throat> the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. The chapter number 1 of the book of Revelation prepares you for the rest of the chapters through 22. It sets the scene for something that as you understand, you begin to read this. It's not the same as it has been. The book of Revelation begins to manifest the glory of Almighty God. It begins to show you the majesty of the risen, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. When He in His glory comes back to this earth, the earth will not be able to contain Him. The heavens begin to shake. Fire and hail falls from above. The seas turn to blood because of the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came the first time as the Lamb of God to die on a cross and shed His blood so that we could be saved. But this time He comes as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the coming one, the one the Bible has been looking for the desired of all the nations the Lord Jesus Christ the one who's mocked and laughed about and scoffed today and they talk about him like a dog but make no mistake about it in Revelation chapter number 6 the time will come when they'll cry out for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of the Lamb that is coming in his wrath. Chapter number 1, verse 18, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, he said, I am alive forevermore. Behold that real good. If he wasn't alive forevermore, you might as well go home and get drunk. For there is no hope at all anywhere. For there's surely no hope in this world. There's no hope in religion. There's no hope in science. There's no hope in education. There's no hope in society. There's there's no hope in me. There's no hope in you. The hope is in Christ. Because he said, I live, ye shall live also. Amen. Chapter number 4 and uh, verse number 1 opens up with a scene in heaven in the book of Revelation. But verse number 11, it says this, Thou art worthy, O Lord. And that's the theme that runs throughout the book of Revelation. For worthy is the Lamb. You need to understand that. He is worthy. He's worthy to open the seals. He's worthy to open the trumpets. And he's worthy to open the vines of the judgment of Almighty God. He's worthy because he earned it and paid for it on a horrible, rugged Roman cross. Chapter number 5 and verse 1, he said, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne. A book written within and the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals you have te thereof? Tell me, folks, who is worthy? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And he said, I wept because no man was found worthy. But one cried in heaven and said, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Up. You need to understand the import of that. When he opens this book and releases the seals, he lets loose pure hell fire down on planet earth. This earth has never rocked and reeled like it's going to under the judgment hand of God. And there's only one that has the right to do that. No man, no priest, no preacher, no church, no one has that right except the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin. Bless the Lamb. Bless the Lamb. He has the right to pour damnation down upon this earth and it will come forth from his hand. He purchased that right. Make no mistake about that. The Bible said in 512 saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb to receive glory and power and riches and honor and blessing. 
And the Bible says the cherubim and the seraphim and the angels and all that were in glory fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and ever and ever. Off into eternity we'll go one day. My friend, from everlasting to everlasting, eternity. Revelation chapter number 6 opens up the first seal. And the first four seals are a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, and a pale horse. Death and hell follow these horses, famine and sorrow and, and sorrow. The Bible says in the fifth horse, or the fifth seal is an altar where the souls of the slain have been gathered together. Then the sixth seal of the stars of heaven fall to the earth. And here in Revelation chapter number 6 and verse 15, the kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, mighty men, every bondman hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. And they cried and said, hide us from the face of the lamb that sitteth on the throne. Why are you running from a lamb? Just think about it. It. Do you know why? Because in weakness he was crucified. In weakness he gave himself. And it was in the weakness of his obedience unto Almighty God that the strength of the Lamb of God was born. It was because he was obedient to the Father that God gave him all power in heaven and in earth. It was poured out upon his Son. And he'll manifest that power. Make no mistake about it. And that will come soon. The seas are turned to blood. Great mountains cast into the sea. Men die from wormwood. All manner of calamity comes down upon the face of this earth it would be a sermon in itself to tell you all that's going to happen to planet earth but you don't want to be here when that day comes in revelation chapter number nine the bible says a great angel comes down from heaven with a key to the bottomless pit verse number one and then in chapter number nine verse two he opens that bottomless pit in verse 11 it says a baden comes out of that apollyon who is the king over the bottomless pit his name means perdition perdition means damnation and judgment in hell fire forever there was one man on this earth who was called the son of perdition. It will be his spirit that permeates the Antichrist and the great religion of this last days. And who is that? That is Judas Iscariot, the one who sold the Lord Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver that kissed him in the garden of Gethsemane. And the Lord looked at him and said, Judas, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? Oh, the kiss of Judas. To this very day, we still know about the kiss of Judas, that one who professes to be your friend and puts a knife in your back when when the opportunity comes in chapter number 11 and verse number 3, two witnesses are sent there to uh, encounter the Antichrist face to face. Chapter number 11 and verse 7. That beast that cometh out of the bottomless pit will make war, probably Moses and Elijah. And for three and a half years, these two witnesses will cause him all kinds of heartache. The Bible says that he'll kill them. And for three and a half days, their bodies will lie in the streets of Jerusalem. Then a voice from heaven. When God begins to speak from heaven, he has something to say. And he'll say, come up hither. And the Bible says that up they come, stand up upon their feet, and then they're caught up into heaven into the presence of God. And here's what the scripture says, and their enemies watch them as they go up. That must be quite an experience for them. For maybe their enemies are about to get the picture now. Things are going to change drastically. Heaven now is in control. It is no longer the day of man. It is no longer the God of this world that dictates day after day after day what is happening. Now it is heaven rolling back like a scroll. It is almighty God beginning to fire down upon this earth. His voice of condemnation and judgment. The day of grace is past. It is no longer come as you will. It is no longer just as I am without one plea. It is now a day when they cry and an angel flies through heaven with the everlasting gospel and says, keep God's commandments and repent. And that's all that they can do. That Bible tells me in the book of Revelation that during that seven year tribulation period that men will seek death and death will flee from them. And can Revelation continues. Chapter number 12 and verse number one, there's a woman clothed with the sun. And the Bible says that she has 12 crown of 12 stars. And then the scripture says in verse number 7 that there is war in heaven. War in heaven. Can you imagine war in heaven? I'm talking about a war that would make every war, every war that's ever been fought on this earth. You take every last one of them that ever, that ever man's ever fought with all of their weapons. You put them all together and it looked like a Sunday school picnic compared to this war. For this is a war fought by mighty creatures that are far above humanity. 
that have power and might far above anything that you could ever consider. One angel of the Lord killed 186,000 of Sennacherib's troops. And the Bible says there is war in heaven. Michael the archangel who stands for Israel comes against the dragon Satan. And the scripture says that their place is found no more in heaven. And the dragon is cast down to the earth in Revelation 12. And here's what it says. And it says he knows that he has but a short time. And the 13th chapter of Revelation, the rise of the Antichrist. Satan is cast out in chapter 12. And in chapter 13, the Antichrist rises up above men. And he is literally Satan incarnate. He knows he has but a short time. This Antichrist will be a supernatural creature. He'll be a supernatural being with supernatural abilities. He can sway millions of people and bring them to his cause. He has power through his false prophet to bring fire down from heaven. It is unbelievable at the amount of deception that he'll have at his command. He can say and do as he essentially pleases and nobody on this earth can stay his hand. This Antichrist will rise in Revelation chapter number 13 and he'll cause every human being on the face of this earth to receive a mark in their forehead or in their hand. And my friend, his number is six, six. Six. Put that down in your book somewhere. And remember when that number shows up. Six. 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 That that is the number of the Antichrist. Revelation 13. The Antichrist will be manifested to this earth. And this earth has never known a time when it has to deal with one like him. Satan incarnate in flesh. Knowing that he hath but a short time left. In Revelation chapter number 13. It ends by saying this, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six, 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 six. In the 16th chapter of the book of Revelation, the Bible said they gathered together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Ar Megiddon. The scripture says in chapter number 16, verse 19, that that great Babylon came in remembrance before God. God has specific judgments that he intends to inflict upon this earth. He not only will inflict upon the earth physical, he'll inflict upon the earth with the people and also he will come after specific religious groups and the Antichrist and his kingdom. He knows exactly what he intends to do. In chapter number 17 and verse number 1 of the book of Revelation, the scripture says, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. My, 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 what a thing this is. A few weeks ago I preached to you about a prophecy of Malachi that was given in 1140 AD, how that there would be 112 popes that would start with the prophecy of 1140 AD and end with the last pope whose name is supposed to be Petrus Romanus. In plain words, Peter the Roman. And this last pope would be the one that would bring in the power into the Catholic Church to be able to stand up against the Antichrist as he is manifested on this earth. Now they're coming out with another prophecy and that prophecy is saying that there's going to be an imposter who becomes a pope. And the imposter that becomes a pope is going to take the Catholic Church into apostasy where they will join forces with the Antichrist. Would you listen to me this morning? Would you please listen to me? The Word of God is the source of authority. This Bible is what I look to for understanding. I know how deceptive confusion can be. I told you before all of this stuff about Malachi may simply be God Almighty using them to bring about the end time deception of 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Hold it and watch carefully and see who they put on the chair of St. Peter because in a few days they will elect a new pope. But my friend, if his name is Peter, you better watch carefully because we may be so near to the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ we won't have time to get ready. He may be coming so soon that all we can do is shout the victory and say even so come Lord Jesus come I can feel it in my soul and I want the heavens to open and I want him to come and catch us up to meet him in the clouds and in the air something's happening make no mistake about it and it's not something that's catching God off guard and it's not the devil doing anything outside of what God intends to get done it will happen 
exactly as he says it would. In Revelation chapter number 17, verse 1, he said, and I, he, he said, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. In the book of Revelation, it says, come out from among her, my people. That tells me that there must be those in that institution that do know the Lord. And he's giving them a final warning. And he's telling them to separate themselves from this ab abominable apostasy that's coming upon planet Earth. It's here today, folks. And it will manifest itself in the next few years, depending on when the tribulation time takes place. But we know this. Revelation 18, verse number 2 says, Babylon the great is fallen is fallen and become the habitation of devils every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird but in revelation chapter number nine and verse number one after these things i heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying hallelujah yeah. salvation and glory and honor and power to the lord our god for true and righteous are his judgments You've just read through five or six, you've read through a bunch of chapters of one bolt of judgment after another bolt of judgment of God's wrath and condemnation upon this earth. And then you get to chapter number 19 and he said, true and righteous are his judgments for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. But in chapter number 19 and verse seven, it says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come yeah. hallelujah to god amen the marriage of the lamb is come you understand what's going on here while all hell's being poured out down here on this earth we get together at a great table up there in glory the king of the universe is going to sit down at the end of that table and all of us sat down on either side of it why he arranges that's his business but i know one thing glory to god i plan on being there I plan on being there. How you know you're going to make it, preacher? Because the blood has covered my soul. That's how. Because I've been to Calvary and I've had my sins washed away. I know that I know that I know in whom I have believed. I know him in my soul. I know him in my spirit. I know him in my heart. I know him every way and I want to know him every way that I possibly can. For I want to know that I know that I know that when I take the last breath on this earth, I know where I'm going. Do you know that, friend? If you don't know that, you're a fool. You're the biggest fool that ever lived. If you don't know what's going to happen to you when life leaves your body, where you think you're going? Don't listen to a bunch of atheists and agnostics that say, well, you die like a dog. How do they know? They don't have a clue what lies beyond death and beyond the grave, but I do. He said, I'm he that liveth and was dead. He said, look at me. I'm alive forevermore and I'm going to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And my friend, when judgment comes here, grace and mercy's poured out there. When judgment comes down, grace and mercy will surround us while they cry and they plead here we'll rejoice and we'll sing there amen that can't be taken from us that's ours by heritage it's ours because we know him and he knows me and i bless his name in the name of jesus i stand before you hallelujah to that name there's no name like that name but the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 19 and verse number 11, I saw heaven opened. Oh boy, did you hear that? I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So you say, preacher, can the lowly Galilean, that little lamb of God, what are you talking about making war? You ain't seen war till he comes making war. He comes with a drawn sword. He comes with it pro pro proceeding forth out of his mouth. That means there's no mercy. That means there's no grace. That means there's no altars down here. People crying out to be saved. It means he's wrapped it up and it's over. And it's time now to manifest power. The power of holiness. The power of glory. The power of goodness. The power of God. As it is manifested against the power of evil. The power of wickedness. The power of Satan. What he's been ruling this world by for centuries. A, con a confrontation takes place. It's inevitable. It will happen as soon as you hear me. A confrontation will take place between the force of hell and the force of God. Yeah. Guess what's going to happen when that happens? Uh -huh. oh, yes, brother. Guess what's going to happen? The Bible says in verse number 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the throne, on the horse rather, and against his army. And the beast was taken, verse number 20, Revelation 19, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. If I knew that my eternal... Uh, uh, 
uh, eternal uh, home would be a, a, like a fire and brimstone. It would harden me and it would turn me into the most vile, wicked thing you can imagine. And that's exactly what he is. Revelation chapter number 20. Verse number two, he laid hold on that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a, a little season. And then when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his presence. And verse number 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are a thousand years later, Revelation 20 verse 10, the beast and the false prophet have been in the lake of fire a thousand years and Satan now is cast into it and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then in chapter number 20 and verse 11, I want you to think about this and you might get an idea of what you're about to read. The next time you pray, how, whatever it takes for you to do it, I want you to do it. The next time you get down on your knees before God, and I hope it's before the sun goes down today, if you haven't already, that you, when you get down to pray and you, begin to, and you get down there to talk to the Lord, I want you to imagine that the, everything on your side is gone. I want you to imagine everything above your head is gone. I want you to imagine everything below you is gone. I want you to imagine that you're suspended in space and it's just you and God. I want you to think about the fact that you're here, he's there, and there's nothing else. That's exactly the scene in Revelation chapter number 20. He said, I saw heaven and earth fled away. But this would help you every day when you pray. It'd help you tomorrow, it'd help you next week. Every time you pray, if you had the attitude when you pray, there ain't nothing here, nothing around me, nothing above me, nothing beneath me. Just me and God, just me and God. And I'm appalled. He's holding me here, yes. right here, by the word of his power. Amen. And in a sense, that is very true. Because that would give you the right attitude that you need in prayer. And that attitude is just me and him and nothing else. He doesn't need an earth to hold you up. He doesn't need atmosphere to hold you up. No. He doesn't need anything to hold you up. And one day, he'll sit on a white throne, the Lord Jesus Christ. And march before him every creature that's ever drawn the breath of life. And they won't be standing on anything. They'll just be standing before him. The heaven and the earth is gone. They'll just be standing out there in space. There won't be any space. Space is gone. When the Lord Jesus showed up 2,000 years ago, he was like planet earth. If you go out into space, it's pure black. It's dark. It's dark because there's nothing that can catch the rays of the sun. You have to have an atmosphere. You have to be like the moon You catch it. You see the space is just pure dark. But when the Lord Jesus showed up, he caught the ray of God Almighty that manifested in him in the darkness of this world. And it shone forth so that all could see. That's what you'll see on that throne. You'll see that glory that glorified the Lord Jesus Christ emanating from his presence. You'll see the Son of God, the Ancient of Days, the hair white as snow, eyes a flame of fire. You'll see the blessed Lamb of God and all of His creatures gathered before Him to be judged. I'm so glad, thankful unto God that He's already judged me and Christ paid my judgment. I'm so glad. And then the Bible says in Revelation 21, Verse number two, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Amen. Verse four, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Who are you going to hug when you get to heaven, when your tears are all dried up and you realize that it was all worth it? What mama, what daddy? What child have you got a son or a daughter that's gone on before you? Yes. How about a brother or sister? How about a husband or a wife? Yes. How about a dear loved one? One that broke your heart when they left this world, but they're in the presence of the Lord. Amen. That reunion day, cannot, your words can't describe it. Amen. To just be with them and to know it's going to be forever now. Amen. It'll never be separated again. There's no graveyards in heaven. There's no suffering in heaven. Amen. There's no sorrow in heaven. 
There's no hell in heaven. It's all heaven, friend. It's all glory. Glory forever. He said unto me, verse 6, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Like he said in chapter 1, the beginning and the end, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And then the apostle John said, he carried me away in a spirit to a great mountain, showed me the great city, holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper, clear as crystal. Then he begins to describe it with the walls of, of, uh, of uh, j uh, pearl, gates of pearl, walls of jasper, streets of pure gold. But he said in verse 22, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God and the Lamb are the there temple it of it. Is, the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine at it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. That's why I'm going. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. Amen. They which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Are you written in that book? Yes, I can. Then the last chapter of Revelation. He showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of either side was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, yielded her fruit of every month, and leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega. There he says it again. In other words, he said, I'm the first and last word about anything. The beginning and the end, the first and last. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth come. Let him that is a thirst come. I like this. Yes. And whosoever will, Amen. let him take the water of life freely. Amen. The book of Revelation ought to scare the daylights out of you. It ought to set you on edge. But then it finishes by a gracious invitation. A gracious invitation. Gracious. Gracious. He that testifieth these things saith, verse 20, Surely I come quickly. Even so come, Lord Jesus. John said, Come. And then the last thing in the Bible. We start with the creation in Genesis. We've gone a long way. You know it took 2,000 years nearly to write this book. Depends on when Job was written. If it was written 1900 B.C., we're looking at 2,000 years. Nobody, we don't know who wrote Job. Don't let anybody tell you they know. Tradition says Moses did. Maybe he did. If he did, he wrote it about 14, 1500 B.C. We don't know. 2,000 years in writing this book. And here's the last thing God says in this book. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Grace. I don't care what you've done, how sorry and low down you are, and some of you are as sorry and low down as it comes. Amen. You've gone from church to church and been into self-help pro programs and pumped yourself up and made and thought good about yourself and thought good thoughts and, and, and you've had prosperity preached to you until it's running out your ears, but you're the same old sinner you've always been. Nothing has changed. I offer you grace. Yes, thank you. So what does that mean, preacher? That means God doesn't care what you've done. It doesn't matter how low down you are. His blood will cover that sin. He will forgive you. He will save you. He will take you into the body of Christ. That's why Calvary was so horrible. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. He had to suffer everything the cross could offer to suffer. He had to drink the dregs of the wrath of God to the uttermost. He had to give himself absolutely and completely. And then when he did, the Bible said God smelled a sweet savor and was satisfied. 
It took that to save a man. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray I preached what you laid on my heart. And I bless your holy name for it, Holy One. And one more time that I can stand and proclaim your word. Jesus, blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, glorify thyself now in this house. In thy sweet name we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> Brother Silvius is going to get us a song together. We'd like to give you an invitation if you'd like to like to stand with us if you'd like to come down here and pray. You have an invitation. The age of grace is still in vogue. We're still preaching grace. We're still preaching uh, whosoever will. We're still preaching come as you are. We're still preaching you can be born again by the grace of God. Your sins can be forgiven no matter what you've done. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. We're preaching that. But one day that door will slam shut. And when it does, it will change. It'll no longer be a throne of grace. It'll be a throne of judgment. Won't you come? Won't you come? Page 392 and you're all American. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, blessed Lamb. Thank you, blessed Lamb. Blessed be your holy name, Son of God. Son of God. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Oh, yes. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins. <coughs> Blessed Lamb of God. Blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus. Come, won't you come? Lose all their guilty stains. Won't you come? Revelation, Revelation chapter number one and verse five said, who hath washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's what it says in my Bible. Amen. If it doesn't say that in your Bible, you need to get the right Bible. Amen. If your Bible said, loosed us from our sins, you got the wrong Bible. He hath washed us from our sins. It's the difference between luo and lauo. Two little Greek words has everything to do with the doctrine of the cleansing of the blood of Christ. Don't let anybody mess with your Bible. That's what he said in the last book, last chapter. If you add to the words of this book, God will add the, the, the plagues to you. If you take from the words of this book, God will take your part out of the book of life. That's serious. Sing another verse. Would you come? All my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all, Wash all my sins away. You mean everything, preacher? Everything. say, preacher, I've done things I wouldn't want anybody to know about. God knows about it. And he doesn't want you telling everybody about it. No. But I'll tell you one thing, he'll forgive you for it. He'll forgive you for it. 
He'll forgive you for it. First of October, a doctor walked into the room over there at North Knoxville Medical Center. Cardiologist looked at me and he said, your heart's failing. I said, you got heart failure. That hit me like a ton of bricks. He said it very grimly. <laughs> you got heart failure. That's what he said. Then I got a diagnosis back a day or two later, said you got congestive heart failure. I thought, well, Lord, I'm, I'm dying. And a couple of times at home, I got real cold and clammy and my heart, my arms felt like that they were lead. I had all the symptoms of a heart attack. Went to the emergency room. Something happened this morning, this morning, while I was at the table, looking out in the back. That's been five months. I felt something lift from me this morning. Felt it lift. I did. Felt it lift. It's almost like the Almighty said, now I put you five months, I put you where you are now. I'm taking it up. I felt it lift. I've told you before and I'll tell you again, I'm in this world to do two things. I'm in this world to preach God's word and I'm in this world to teach his word. Minister that word to the people. That's why I'm alive and my life is in his hands and that's why I'm here. And I'll live as long as he wants me to live and I feel good about it because I've given him my life for my life, my breathing, my everyday life. And I gave him my soul in 1973. I felt it lift. I can't explain what lifted, but I know something lifted. That's the way God deals with the people who belong to him. You ever know what I'm talking about? Five months, five months, there was something like a mantle that hung over me, but I felt it lift this morning. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Amen.